Hey, this is Pastor John. Thanks so much for tuning in to either download or stream this study. Uh, we pray that this blesses you. There are a couple of things that we would like to lay before you quickly. Uh, number one is that you would consider this message supplemental in your walk with the Lord, that in no way would it replace either your being plugged into the church at the local church level or you listening to your local church pastor who has been charged with the care for your soul. Having said that, we do pray that um, this study of God's word would, would help you see and savor the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we would pray also that if, if this ministry blesses you, that you would prayerfully uh, consider supporting VXV. And if you do, you can do so by clicking on the link below or by going to our website at vxvchurch.com. Now, I pray that God stirs your affections for Jesus Christ as you, as you dial into now the, the proclamation of God's word. Well, good morning once again. <clears throat> Excuse me. Today I'm going to be talking with you guys about something that is so incredibly important for us. It's so beautifully easy to, sim to see the correct choice, and yet so wildly challenging for us to put it into practice. Now, if you have not already, would you open uh, the, the anchor text, Luke 14, 25 through 33. Have that in front of you as we go along. We're going to talk about that later. So today we're talking about counting the cost of following God. Now, allow me to set the stage of how this rather uncomfortable and provoking topic is what I landed on for us today. So before God led me here to join the church on staff, I was a police officer for nine years, as many of you already know that. I also know that there are a handful of people here uh, who are currently or have been in the past involved in law enforcement, so you guys understand what, what I'm saying when I talk about it. So officers get asked all the time what it is that they like about doing the job. And I was one time quoted in saying, well, I just like driving around, trying to catch people doing stuff wrong. We also have people say to us all the time, I, I don't understand how you can do such a dangerous job, you know, not knowing what's going to happen on the next call or the next traffic stop. It's really hard to explain that to somebody. But, but in short, the reality is this. Police officers have counted the cost of what it might cost them. But we count it as a worthwhile cost because we know that we are helping people, we are serving people, protecting people, and it's worth taking that risk for us. It's a career that, for anybody that's never been a part of it, let me try to sum this up, it's a career that is challenging and very rewarding, scary at times, and ridiculously fun, all at the same time. It's a very noble calling. It really, being God's agent of justice here on this earth. So while there were many devastating and twisted cases that we face, it brought me great joy to be involved in helping bring peace to people. Even just a shred of peace in what is certain to be remembered as one of the most significant moments in their life. So in short, law enforcement is just one of those things that is in you. And there is no amount of time or distance that is going to scrub it out of you. So when I left law enforcement for the first time in uh, July of 2020, I missed it from the day that I left it. And I wished, every day I wished that I could go right back to it. And I was very seriously considering it every day. But I knew that God had called me out of it for a reason. Then early last year in uh, 2022, 
I had the chance to, to be able to go back into it for a short time, knowing that it was just a temporary thing before I came here to the church. It was, it was a great blessing to be able to go back into it for a short time. But as the time came close for me to transition here to my pastorate, knowing how much I had missed law enforcement the first time, and knowing how badly I wanted to stay connected to the police department that I was leaving, the Constantine Police Department, I really loved it there, and I loved the people that I was working with. So I was actually planning on staying on with the department in a, just a very limited part-time spot. But I was really convicted in a recent sermon um, on Matthew 16. Jesus' words in Matthew 16, 24 through 26, he says, If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what good will it do a person if he gains the whole world but forfeits his soul? Or what will a person give in exchange for his soul? God used that, that passage to show me that though I was following him, I was not really adequately counting the costs. So by now you may be asking yourselves, if, if Matthew 16 was what really convicted you, then why are we looking at Luke 14? Well, I'm glad that you asked. And the reason is, I want you all to see that there is a real need for counting the cost and considering that before we can really truly become disciples. And that's the distinction that Jesus makes in Luke 14. Now hear me now, because I am not saying that you must count the cost before becoming a believer. I think that Pastor John did a really great job last week of dispelling that notion and speaking of the rich young ruler. And if you missed that one, go back and get it, because it really ties in closely with what we're talking about today. Now what I am emphasizing for us is that in order to enjoy a deep richness of being a disciple, we really need to count that cost before we start. We need to have the value and understand what it might cost us to follow God in exchange for the infinite value of being his child. Now, turn your attention to Luke 14 with me as we start in verse 25. Now, large crowds were going along with him, and he turned to them and said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and Come after me, cannot be my disciple. So we see what's going on. We see that Jesus, once again, is being followed by these ever present large crowds. The, the crowds were growing because people wanted to be a part of this big event. Maybe they wanted to be close to him because they hoped that he would help their lives, fix their lives, heal them give them money or food or any sort of other blessing. There were also many in the crowds, both then and today, by the way, that like to be close to Jesus because it's just entertaining to see what he can do. So here in this teaching, Jesus is aiming this very striking teaching at a large crowd of people. And this is for the purpose of sifting out the fans from the followers. Now in verse 26, Jesus comes right out of the gate swinging. And he says that if, if we want to come to him, we must hate everyone that is dear to us. And if we do not, 
well, we cannot be his disciples. Now, the Greek word here for hate is meseo, which is used figuratively here and elsewhere, meaning to love less. For example, look at Romans 9, when Paul talks about, uh, when he's quoting Malachi, he says, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Now, God was not saying that he really hated Esau, but he was saying that he preferred Jacob, or you could say that he loved Esau less than Jacob. But it's the same word. Now, there are a few other ways that we can easily understand that Jesus was not telling us that we have to literally hate people. The first is this. If, if Jesus was telling us to hate, then, then Jesus is saying that we have to sin in order to follow him. And that just doesn't make any sense. Another way is that we see Jesus did not literally hate his own mother because as he was dying on the cross, he was asking his disciples to take care of her. So what Jesus is doing here is using some very strong language to make the point, well, if Jesus is not wanting us to actually hate, then what is he after? What does this mean? Well, here it is. Jesus is telling them and us today what it means to be his disciples, not believers, disciples. We might remember that when Jesus called his 12, they were each willing to abandon everything that they had and every one to follow Christ. Not because they suddenly hated their families, but because they could see the much greater value in following Jesus as his disciples. The idea here is that Jesus must be preeminent in our lives. In verse 27, Jesus says that we must carry our cross and follow him. What this is really means for us is that we must be ready to joyfully stand up under the weightiness of the burden that is self-denial as we seek to follow Christ. And we must carry that unto whatever degree of sacrifice is required of us for the sake of doing his work on this earth. Now I've got some help here from J. Vernon McGee in this quote. He says, you can be saved by just accepting Christ, but, my friend, you will never follow him and you will never serve him until you are willing to make a sacrifice. That's the thing he is saying here. There is a difference in being a disciple and being a believer. A believer should be a disciple. But unfortunately, they all are not. Well, now, what Jesus is after here is this. In order for us to flourish as one of his disciples, to be able to focus our attention and our affections on him as we ought to, we must place him in a position of complete and utter, unchallenged supremacy in our desires and affections. Part of that is that we must learn to trust in his sovereignty, that he will care for our loved ones as he knows is best, and that he will even do it better than we can do it ourselves. When we determine to begin this journey of discipleship, it will be crystal clear to everyone around us that we miseo, that we love less, 
the people that we are closest to, all of the things that we have, even ourselves, then we love God. Jesus is separating the fans from the followers. Now we're going to move and look at the first of the two parables that Jesus has here in verse 28. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. So here in verse 28, Jesus is using this, this brief parable about a construction project to illustrate for us the upfront work a disciple must do. Now the first thing that we see in this mini parable as Jesus starts is he's talking about believers who are wanting more. This is not something that you will stumble into, but rather already being saved, you have the desire to lean deeper into God and you are ready to be intentional and faithful as you seek to be a disciple, a bondservant of Christ. Now don't get weird on me now, okay? Remember that Jesus is specifically talking about a believer becoming a disciple. Nobody can go from being an unbeliever to being a disciple without first becoming a believer. We know that is only through God's work, not our own. So we see here now that there is a clear desire to build something, and now it's going to be built. And pay attention because this life of discipleship that we seek to build is going to be visible and recognizable. Now look here with me at the Greek word for build. It is oikodomeo, which means build or strengthen or build up. But it also has metaphorical terms, meaning to promote growth and wisdom and grace and affection and holiness. Oikodomeo has the same root words as oikodome, which Paul uses a few times specifically for the purpose of edification. Now, the root words for oikodomeo are oikos, which is house, and dome, which is a flat roof. Now, I found this very interesting. I tell you this for this reason. It was common then, and it still is in many areas, for people to walk on the roof of their house as they meditate in prayer. So we see that, that what we're building is a space to pray, a space to grow closer to God. So it's very interesting to me there that Jesus used that word and placed some emphasis on building as well. Now we come to uh, what is going to be built. Well, it's a tower. The word here is purgos, which means a fortified structure or a safe, convenient dwelling, which in the context of discipleship is, of course, a picture of finding our safety and security in God alone as we learn from and follow him. I believe it is quite clear to the crowd that day that Jesus was saying, in order to build a close and safe relationship with me, you must love me more than anything else. Okay, I think we can all agree that Jesus is not asking us to build our personal or eternal security around a physical strong tower. He is not calling the crowd 
or us to become preppers, doing it on our own. No, let's just look back again at the rich young ruler and the lesson that Jesus had for the 12 in that encounter. No matter how much money we have, no matter how many towers we build, no matter how much food or medical supplies or weapons we stockpile, it will not be enough. There is no true security in it. And brothers and sisters, let me just love you well. Because if we seek after that security in ourselves or our stuff or our family and friends more than we do in God, then we've missed the mark. So as we turn to verse 29 and 30, we see that this that it, we see what will happen if this builder here begins his project without really understanding the cost involved. Well, he's taking on a huge risk that he might fail and be ridiculed and mocked. Now, before we get too judgy, we know how projects go sometimes when we don't count the cost adequately, right? We've all been there. Sometimes we go in half blind because we're just really excited and we just want to get started. But we don't understand the costs involved or the steps involved in it. Now also sometimes things happen where things cost more money than we expect or we, maybe we just simply don't have the money that we expected. But all of that considered, in the end what happens when we don't start off right is we are left with a poor foundation. We're left with a project that's not completed the way that it should be. So if the builder gets started without understanding the cost, he does not have what it takes to follow through with the work, then he's left with his foundation that is just completely useless. And anything that's built up on the foundation, any bit of that tower over time is just going to crumble and fall apart. Now what this means for us is this. We should, be, we should already know that being a Christian is not a fix-all. God is not an easy button for us to just push and get our results. Having that mindset of God is what leads people to have a, a very fast and boisterous start to their faith journey. But then just a few months in, they're ready to give up on God and on church, and everything else altogether, just because they did not get what they wanted. Their problems did not suddenly disappear. Now, they may have built a foundation, but it was garbage right from the start. It reminds me of the parable of the four soils. Now, to avoid these problems, we need to start with the solid foundation of biblical teaching, right biblical teaching, so we can stand firm in the truths of scriptures, and we can love God supremely. And may I suggest to you that you cannot love God as you ought to if you are not immersed in the word of God. Because that is where God reveals himself. But remember also that a solid foundation must include an understanding of what wholeheartedly following God could cost you. So what might this cost us? Well, for starters, the world might think we are weird. <laughs> oh no! You know, that was actually one of, the, uh, one of the greatest compliments that I ever got as a police officer was uh, a friend of mine said, uh, after he got saved, he said, you know, when we first met, man, I just thought you were so weird. Anyway, I digress. Uh, we might not fit in with our old crowds because we are not a part of those old sins anymore. And thus, we must need to make new friends. We might be mocked, or we might be muzzled in our workplaces or our schools. It could cost you your job, your home, 
your loved ones, and your reputation. But no matter what price is asked of us, we must be okay with paying that price for the sake of the kingdom of God. Now this parable is here to show us that not counting these and other costs leaves us short of realizing the fullness of joy that God has in store for us. But bear in mind also, if you give up on this journey of true discipleship, it will bring mockery and ridicule and shame not only on you, but on God's holy name as well. Now we have verses 31 and 32, the second parable. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. Now, what is this parable getting after? Okay, it still has the aspect of counting the cost, but this one has a different and a deeper meaning in it. This time, we're not talking about counting the cost of the venture itself, but rather we are talking about the overall considering the overall value of the costs. The the parable of the tower was talking about earthly costs, where this parable is talking about eternal value. What earthly costs are we willing to pay for serving Christ? Now, the war being waged here is the spiritual war that the evils of the world are raging and waging against our souls. So here we have the word for meet, to meet another king in battle. Meet here means, uh, the word is symbolo, and it can mean a hostile encounter, but it also means to ponder or to converse with oneself. How interesting is that? Jesus is talking about the spiritual war that is going on inside of each and every one of us. So here we are, the king with the 10,000, and the evils of this world, along with our own sinful desires, are the 20,000. The idea here spiritually is that we are outnumbered and undergunned on our own. The consideration then here is this. Are we, on our own, going to take on evil and survive? No. It's clear here that we will not survive on our own. In order to survive this battle, we all must make a choice. Are we willing to stand and fight? Are we willing to give all that we have to Christ and follow him as he leads us through this battle? This is the battle, remember, against our sinful nature and the, in, the evil influences. Okay? Or are we going to arrange for peace with the prince of darkness so that we can avoid the massacre? 
if we choose to take the side of Christ, to fight the battle against the sin that rages within us, to stand firm against the evils of this world that are trying to drag us into the darkness. We need to understand that we cannot do this in the energies of our own flesh. Well then, some may say, if you are not willing to pay the cost of fighting with Christ in this way, then is it not better for you to, uh, to just make peace with the prince of darkness? That way you can avoid the shame and ridicule. Listen to me, because I am not advocating for anyone to actually turn themselves over to Satan and accept hell. I am merely making this point obvious for us to see the choices that are before us. We must make a choice. And if you desire to be with God as his disciple, there is only one right choice. Now, this is not to say that if you are not ready to yield everything to God, then you are not saved or that you could lose your salvation. The Bible is very clear that nothing and no one can take us out of his hand. And it's very clear that God will never leave us nor forsake us. And the truth is this. If you are at a point in your faith where you are counting these costs, I think it's very likely that you are closer to being a disciple than you realize you are. Now look here at this, uh, the word. Uh, it's, it's just wonderful. It's smuggled right in here. I love it. The word for consider here is buleo. The king considers his strength. Buleo means to consult or to take counsel. We can learn from this word that Jesus is not intending for discipleship to be a solo sport. The life of a disciple is really tough sometimes. And we need to have a team of people surrounding us, a community of fellow disciples, so that we can help to keep one another on track. This is the reason that Jesus had 12 chosen disciples. Okay? It, yes, the, there was a lesser part of the reason of the 12 that was for Jesus to be able to effectively maximize his teaching. But far more importantly for us is this. He knew that they and we could not do this alone. We need to be surrounded by fellow disciples so that we can have good and wise and godly counsel in this life. But remember that you will only get out of that community that which you are willing to put into others. This must be a give and a take. Now, as we move into verse 33, pay attention, okay? It says, So therefore, anyone who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. And this is a verse where people under poor teaching or having faulty understanding of, of the Bible will really easily get hung up. So we have a quote here from John Piper to help us out. He says, Now there are two absolutes in this sentence. One is found in the phrase, anyone, and it applies to every disciple, not just a select few. Anyone 
who does not renounce all. Okay, that's the first absolute. The other absolute is found in the word all. You must renounce all that you have to be my disciple. Your resources may stay in your sway as a manager, a steward, but you must be ready at any time to let it all go for the sake of Jesus. For the sake, or <laughs> messed that up there. Anyway, now the key point of this teaching here in Luke is not perfection. It is not a command for us to sell everything and give to the poor. It is not a command to abandon our families and move away so that we can live in solitude in a life of complete self-denial. In fact, we are actually called to be in the world, but not of the world. It's John 17. So the point of verse 33 is that we must renounce our claim to ownership of everything in life in exchange for recognizing, as Job did, that the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Jesus is calling us to follow him as he leads us through this process of sanctification. It may be the slow work of grace, moving us one degree at a time, but we are moving. Perhaps some of you needed to hear that today. Let me try to bring some perspective to this whole thing. I think we all have a, a basic understanding of value and cost uh, as it pertains to goods or services that we, that we may buy. But for those of us who have, like me, ever been stuck in a conversation doing the, the old smile and nod, you know, doing the old smile and nod routine because you found yourself in a conversation with an apparent financial guru. Let me just start with the few things that I know about value. So if a company has a new product and they want to um, determine its value, they need to know the cost of production, and they also need to know what the average customer is going to be willing to pay for the product. That also helps to set the the, the value. Well, how, does, how do we determine the value of eternity in heaven? Or the value of spending our lives as a disciple under Jesus Christ? I'm not talking about the value of justification. The value of that is so high that God paid that for us through Jesus so that he could give us the free gift. No, the point then becomes... What are we willing to set aside that is holding us back from engaging fully into the matchless worth and value and joy of discipleship? Counting the cost versus understanding the value looks like this, according to the Bible. Matthew 6 says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, but store them up in heaven. Now that is paying the earthly cost. Don't store up treasures on earth. Matthew 13 says that heaven is like a treasure and it beats all treasure. It's worth everything that you have. So here we have that earthly cost and that eternal value. Heaven has an infinite value. Now we see that the value of the treasure that is heaven, but do we see the promise? Pastor John taught us last week in the conclusion of the rich young ruler that whatever you set aside for the sake of the kingdom, that is going to come back to you many times over, both in this life and in the resurrection. The end result of choosing to build this tower of a life in Christ 
is that we would learn to trust him fully to shape us and use us by his great goodness and mercy and his sovereignty and his supremacy to become more like him. When Jesus says that the builder counts the cost to see if he has enough to finish, what he is doing is he is challenging us to discern if we have enough faith to truly give complete control of our lives to God. That is what being a disciple is all about. Completely yielding everything and every relationship should it be required of you, as well as every bit of who you are for the advance of the kingdom as he sees fit to use you. And this is for his glory and for your flourishing. Just know this. When the time comes to set these things aside, we won't have time to count the cost anymore. We need to count the cost of our stuff, our careers, our comforts and relationships, and even our own life in advance. Being ready to lay it all aside at a moment's notice. Because I promise you this, brothers and sisters, that there is nothing in this world, you will never find anything in this life that will bring more actual value than standing before the Creator and hearing Him say, well done, good and faithful servant. So this begs the question, what in your life has become an idol? What are you holding on to? What sins or pleasures or achievements or possessions or people are we holding on to and loving more than we love God? Well, for me, law enforcement was at the top of that list. That conviction that I spoke of earlier made me realize I was trying to hold on to a part of my life. I was not counting the cost. I was not yielding myself fully unto God. And I realized that I must set that chapter of my life aside for His glory and for the sake of my soul. Now, I, I am already seeing the benefits of having done that. I have less stress. I have more freedom to truly enjoy my job here without having to worry about uh, law enforcement and the schedule and affecting my family. I just know that when I set that aside for God, I felt peace. The burden was gone. And man, I just hope that you guys can find that peace too. Let's pray. Dear God, I just want to come now before you and recognize your goodness and your sovereignty and your graciousness and your infinite value. Lord, there is nothing on this earth, nothing in our life that could ever, ever compare to the value that is you. So Lord, I ask that you would help us all to search our hearts, Lord. I ask that you would search our hearts and that you would reveal to us what it is that's holding us back from experiencing that true fullness of joy that is waiting
Lord, we just do this for your glory. Amen.